See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. The role that I get to serve as associate dean, especially as a young black woman, means so much to me because we want our nursing administration to really mirror the students that we serve in the same way that we want our healthcare professionals to really mirror the patients that they serve. Right now, that's not necessarily the case, and there's all sorts of research out there that says patients have better outcome when they have providers that they can identify with. Less than 1% of nurses have doctoral degrees. I'm happy to be a part of the 1%, but I have to also be a part of the change to increase that number. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. The existence of racial disparities in healthcare in the United States is heavily documented. And what becomes crystal clear from boundary-breaking clinicians addressing health disparities is that representation matters. When the person who cares for you looks like you, trust and quality of care improve. Cultivating a diverse workforce that looks and lives like the communities they care for requires a concerted effort, one that begins in our schools and training programs. In this episode, we're on the road at Sigma Nursing's Creating Healthy Work Environments Conference where we meet a nurse practitioner and educator who is fostering diversity, inclusion, and belonging in the academic setting in order to build a more representative workforce. On her travels across town and around the world, she's taking the next generation of nurses along with her and teaching them how being in the community is the key to keeping people connected, strong, and healthy. I am Dr. Selena Gillis. I am an adult nurse practitioner. I specialize in pain management, also community and global health. I'm a clinical associate professor at NYU Roy Myers College of Nursing, where I also serve as the associate dean of the undergraduate program. I am the daughter of a Haitian immigrant. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, where there aren't a lot of resources. And so my mission is really to improve those health inequities combat those healthcare disparities in communities of color, but in the entire world. So is this your first time in Austin or what do you know about Austin? This is my first time in Texas, period. In Texas? <laughs> yeah. So um, how come you haven't made it to, to Texas or to Austin? I don't know. My work life just hasn't brought me here. But the, the one thing that I love about being in this profession is that I get to travel so much. So I've been to a lot of cities all around the United States, all around the world, which is great. Good. So tell me about the Sigma Conference. Why, why did you want to be here? I love the Creating Healthy Work Environments Conference. I think it was the very first Sigma conference that I actually presented at. I have been involved in Sigma for many years, actually since I completed my master's degree, and Sigma has really taken me all over the world. I was the Region 14 coordinator previously, which is the New York and New Jersey chapters. I am the treasurer of my own chapter at NYU. I was the former president-elect and president, and right now I'm actually working with a new Academic Leadership Academy, where I serve as an advisor now with my second cohort. So I really love Sigma and attending the Sigma conferences. Say more about healthy work environments and why you're here this year, what you're talking about. This year, I came to present about an interprofessional program that we have at my university where nursing students and medical students can work together. And I think as health professions, a lot of the times we work together without a true appreciation for what each other 
to us, what their role is. And so I came to talk about our program, which we implemented two years ago. We're now in our second cohort. And so our nursing students and our medical students are able to be in the clinical setting together for a full year where they're taking care of the same patient at the same time, but really with a spin on it, with a focus on social determinants of health. And so really assessing that for their patients and bringing that back to the team to talk about the barriers and the challenges and who from the team can help the patient with that so that they can meet their outcomes. That sounds unusual. How how unusual is that? It's very unusual. It's a unique program. You don't see a lot of programs like this around the country, but our deans came together and really felt that it was important for our students to really learn together. Ultimately, it's going to help with patient outcomes. When you look at interprofessional education, there are so many benefits, patient outcomes being the biggest one, but another one being job satisfaction, speaking about mm-hmm. creating healthy work environments. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people who... You know, people who are receiving care, I don't know that they understand or recognize that oftentimes the very first time a surgical team or a procedural team comes Mm -hmm. together is actually the very first time that particular team has come together. Right. That the way we are educated as pharmacists, social workers, physicians, nurses, everybody who plays in that healthcare team, we don't train together. No. And the very first time we meet, is on the playing field. Right. And we don't practice together necessarily. So, And, and because of the people that we're taking care of, every mm-hmm. single time we come together, mm-hmm. it really is the first time yes. that we have done this particular service, procedure, working together as a team. So when you say interprofessional training, Tell me what that looks like. I think the challenge is in looking at the individual curriculum for the social workers, the physicians, the nurses, the physical therapists, the occupational therapists, what they learn, how they learn it, when they learn it is very different. And so when you're trying to align those curricula, it can be very challenging, which our own team, we did see that. And so really looking at where are the commonalities, where are things different, and how can we work together so that they can learn together. It's challenging, but I think it's something that's very important because as you said, they usually are not meeting each other until they work together. And so the fact that they can learn together makes them really appreciate each other's roles. And even some of our nursing students, they'll say, you know, we really do the same things. The medical terminology versus the nursing terminology may be a little bit different. We're really doing the same thing. We have the same goals. And so that aha moment when that goes off for them, is just so amazing to watch. I don't know if people understand this. They might know it intuitively, mm-hmm. but one of one of the other pieces why it's so important for us to train together is that we build trust. Yes. And there is so much that when you're working together as a team that you can communicate with a look, with a nod of the head, oh, yeah. with an inflection of the <laughs> voice. And when you've trained together and you understand what those training pathways are, it builds a level of trust and a a level of understanding, depth of, I know what your training pathway would be. Mm -hmm. I know what you're good at. I know what the limitations are. So I know what to ask. I know, like, you're not the right person to ask. Mm -hmm. How does that improve somebody's experience, either as the patient, the family member, or the person delivering the care, when you have high trust environments? Yeah, I think it's really monumental for our nursing students because I think back to my very first days of nursing, you're afraid to even talk to your patient, let alone to talk to a physician. And so it really helps them, as you said, to build that trust. So really having them understand those roles. And I think it makes them more comfortable. It does improve communication. And ultimately, it's better for our patients and also better for our own job satisfaction. Selena, you wear a lot of hats. There are a lot of things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that personally from the standpoint. I think it makes people, when when people are wearing a lot of different hats, they come at it with a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different networks. So what are all these different hats that you're wearing? I think I'll start with the thing that I'm most passionate about, and that is the work that I do with the Greater New York City chapter of the Black Nurses Association. I think for me as a nurse and even as a student, we don't necessarily think about being a part of something external to what we do every day. And so this is why I emphasize to nursing students, nurses all over, it's really important to be a part of professional organizations. It allows you to network. It allows you to get the mentorship. It allows you to advocate for yourself and your profession. It really just does allow you to grow. And so I met a few individuals and we formed our chapter five years ago. 
and it has been life-changing. I started as the Programming and Community Service Chair, which I still am, and so we put on a lot of events in the community, at least 20 a year, but it also allows us to collaborate with other organizations. So we're doing things to address healthcare disparities in communities of color, and it's amazing. And so we do a lot of health fairs, we do a lot of community work, career days, really going into the community and educating students about healthcare and becoming a nurse, and so that's something that's going to help us to diversify that nursing workforce. My background as a nurse practitioner is pain management. And so I recognize this is the disparities that are seen in communities of color regarding how their pain is managed. And what we know is when someone's pain is not effectively managed, they might resort to other measures to manage their pain, like using street drugs. And so we train nursing students on how to prevent, recognize, signs and symptoms of opioid overdose, something that was really, as I recognized as an educator, was lacking in the curriculum. So So not only just training nursing students, but training the community, people who may not necessarily be aware of what they can do if they see someone who may be experiencing an overdose. A partnership that we are really proud of is working with a nurse at Callan Lord and a club goers, club owners, and we coined this the last night of DJ Save My Life Coalition, if you're familiar with that song. And so we have been doing Narcan trainings. We have this ongoing relationship with them where we are training security guards, club goers, club owners on how to prevent overdose. So that's a perfect area where we can really integrate ourselves to help people to stay safe and to save lives. And so that's a partnership that we're really proud of. We also, as an organization, did a lot during COVID, whether that was handing out uh, COVID vaccinations, having a COVID town hall. Actually, in 2021, we partnered with a federally qualified health center to open up four FEMA vaccine sites in communities of color, because what we realized is that the access to vaccinations weren't there. African Americans make up 13% of the population, but when we look at morbidity and mortality as it relates to COVID, more than 30%. So we wanted to do something about that. So we partnered with Community Health Network, and we partnered with another organization that was really focused called Stop the Spread, and established these four FEMA sites. So there were two in Upper Manhattan. We incorporated our students to really address the gap of COVID taking away so many clinical placements so they can get that hands-on community experience because that's something that's also lacking in nursing programs. And so they were able to come into underserved communities of color, administer vaccines, educate them. We were able to link our participants up with primary care services and any other resources that they may have needed. And we did it at an African-American church that's home to over 180,000 community members. And it was really such an amazing experience. We also did some vaccine pop-up sites where we went to different areas in New York City on a weekend and vaccinated whoever wanted to get a vaccine. And so at the end of it, we ended up administering 28,000 vaccines, over 28,000 vaccines, with our Brooklyn site that was led by doctorly prepared nurse practitioners administering the most vaccines. And so we incorporated all of our members. And so we had nurses, nurse practitioners, LPNs, all working together to administer vaccines in the community. And it was such an amazing, amazing experience. I think we really have to reframe how we think about nursing education. And COVID really did force Mm -hmm. us to do that. I really do think that true healthcare takes place in the community. We don't want people in the hospital. So we need to get them when they're healthy, teaching them about how to stay healthy so that they are not going into the hospital. So one of my missions in being the associate dean is really making sure that our students have diverse learning experiences in the community, 
because what we're seeing is, and this is probably the same in a lot of nursing schools, when they look at that community placement, it may be an ambulatory center. Well, that's not community health. Or it could be that our students are working with some sort of visiting nurse services. And that's great community health. And so giving them more of those experiences. So we have a lot of different partnerships that we have been working on so our students can truly be in the community placements. And the other way I sort of loop in my professional organizations is I bring my students along when I'm doing health fairs so they can interact with members of the community and not just our local community, right? We know that neighborhoods look different everywhere, but not just where we live. What about where there are high rates of hypertension, where there are high rates of other cardiovascular diseases, so bringing the students to the places where people don't necessarily have access to great care. I think it's great for them to see because there are a lot of disparities on how people get care depending on the neighborhood that you're in. And so it helps them to really see those social determinants at play when they're going into the different communities. Another part of that is how you think about community. Of course, we can think about community as where we live, but the community is also part of the the larger world. So not just working locally, but getting our students involved in global health experiences. And so that's another thing that I'm very passionate about, another hat that I wear, really working with different organizations to provide great health care to people in other parts of the world. It's something that I love to do in every chance that I get. I do it. I've been on six medical missions, and people always ask, well, why do you do this work? Why do you care what's happening in this other country? The analogy that I like to use is if my neighbor's house is on fire, even if they live across the street and down the block, that's going to have an impact on me. We saw that with COVID. You have to care about what's happening in other parts of the world. And so I make it my mission whenever I can to go and do some global work. So I have organizations that I work with in Ghana, also in Nigeria, and in Haiti, where my family is from. And speaking of a community, my very first experience as a nurse practitioner was in Haiti on a medical mission after the earthquake. When you're in these settings, your phone probably doesn't work. You may not speak the language, and what you're relying on are your clinical skills. And to me, I think that makes you a better provider, a better nurse, because you're relying on what you know and the skills that you have. And so that was a wonderful experience for me. So wherever I can, I try to make sure that I'm getting my nursing students involved in those global health experiences. And so I've taken seven students to Ghana, where they were able to engage in education with women, with children. We had a huge oral health initiative. I had them go to a high school where they talked to students about sexual education, which was a challenge because they believe in practicing abstinence, not giving out condoms. And so that was an interesting experience for them. I took some students with me last summer to Nigeria. Two of them had just graduated, just took their NCLEX the day that we left to go on the trip. And I, there was also a nursing student and a, a nurse practitioner student with me. And so whenever I can, I really try to bring students along so that they can see what healthcare systems may be like in other countries in comparison to the United States. And it's I, a great place to get ideas. It's a great what place to get ideas. And it's an experience that's very rewarding yeah. and humbling and gives you a true appreciation for what you have that you may take for granted. So Selena, those are some of the hats that you're wearing. Yes. Uh, Talk about the academic hats you're wearing. Yes. So I am a clinical associate professor at NYU where I also serve as the associate dean of the undergraduate program. I've been in nursing education for the same amount of time that I've been a nurse practitioner, 13 years. And those worlds can be very much different, um, but a lot of of connections. I really love doing both, but the role that I get to serve as associate dean, especially as a young black woman, means so much to me because we want our nursing administration to really mirror the students that we serve in the same way that we want our healthcare professionals to really mirror the patients that they serve. Right now, that's not necessarily the case, but we're doing a better job. And so for me, being in this role, I recognize that it's bigger 
than me. It's not just about me and my career aspirations, but it's about those students of color who see me in this role and they see it as, you know, that's something that I can do one day. When I was coming up, when I was in college, I didn't have that representation. My dean didn't look like me. I barely had two professors that looked like me. Mm -hmm. And so for me to be able to be that representation for students of color, that's really big. And so I have a big job that takes me all around the world, that I have a lot of huge responsibilities in being in charge of faculty and 700 plus students. But I recognize how important it is for students of color to really see me in that role. But being in that role also gives me a lot of opportunity to incorporate diversity initiatives into our program. So some of the things that we've been able to do is we launched a Diversity Matters series. And I know you met with Joanna Seltzer from Mm -hmm. Nurses You Should Know. So I'm an advisor on that whole initiative. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was incorporated that into our nursing program. So of course, everyone knows about Florence Nightingale, but there are so many other influential nurses of color out there. And so we've been incorporating that into our nursing program. We've been having diversity, a Diversity Matters series where we talk about different aspects of diversity. And it's not just about ethnicity. I, I, I was just going to say that that is one of the really great things about Nurses You Should Know. These are nurses you should know yes. throughout periods of time, different parts of the world, and um, the different aspects. People don't necessarily appreciate this vast range of influence and care and advocacy and Uh, social justice and movement building and incorporation of technology Mm -hmm. or welcoming immigrants into our country or Mm -hmm. adopting new ways of of care models and where we care for you. I mean, it's it's a very, very, very long list that um, Joanna and Raven have. They've they've gone through this mine and really opened up and excavated. Like, there are so many amazing stories, so many amazing nurses. Um, yes. And I do want to ask you, you're somebody, if you can see it, I can be it. Yes. You, you very much are that. Yes. But what is the data? When we take a look at nursing students, we take a look at health care, we take a look at our communities that we're taking care of, what are the numbers that you are looking at that tells us where we are in terms of the workforce, the education force, um, who's teaching, who's learning? By numbers. We have 4 million plus nurses in the United States. Less than 8% of them are African American. It's even less for Latinx, even less for Asian. More than 60% of the nurses in the United States are white. That's very problematic. If we look at nurse practitioners, the numbers... Say why, just, just quickly, why is that problematic? Because our workforce does not mirror the people that we serve. And there's all sorts of research out there that says patients have better outcome when they have providers that they can identify with. And when we look at nurse practitioners, the number is even lower. Less than 5% of nurse practitioners are And that is very problematic. Less than 1% of nurses have doctoral degrees. I'm happy to be a part of the 1%, (laughs) but I have to also be a part of the change to increase that number. So that was one of the the biggest reasons why I got involved with DNPs of color. And so the the president and CEO... DNP. What is a DNP? (laughs) Doctorate. DNP is of color, yeah. (laughs) Doctorate of Nursing Practice. That's one of the terminal degrees Mm -hmm. that nurses can receive. And so we as nurses have options uh, for doctoral degrees. So we can have a DNP, which is a doctorate of nursing practice. That's what I have. You can have an EDD, which is an educational doctorate, or you can have a PhD, which is a research doctorate. I am a nurse practitioner, so I decided to go the DNP route. And so I met Danielle McCammy, who is the president and founder and CEO of DNPs of Color. I love the work that she's doing to really change the game and forge new paths. That's our theme for the year. I've been in so many spaces where I was the only one, Mm -hmm. and that's still happening. I finished my DNP more than 10 years ago, and still there are people 
who can relate to being the only one. So really DNPs of color, it's really about providing support for other DNPs who are going through that experience, getting that degree and giving them that support via mentorship, advocacy and networking. That's the key part, setting them up for success. It's really about transforming the landscape of nursing and really helping to diversify that nursing workforce. As a provider of color, as a nurse educator of color, we have very unique experiences when we are in those worlds. And depending on where you live, you might be the only person of color at your job, and that is very challenging. So it's nice to have a community of individuals who understand what that experience Mm -hmm. is like, who've been through certain things and really can guide you in your journey and provide you with that support because it's difficult. It's not an easy road. So we're talking a lot about diversifying the the nursing workforce, and I think there are some other strategies that we certainly can implement to help with that. When we look at nursing education, 14% of black nurses have master's degrees. We need to increase that number. And so the way that we can encourage nurses of color to advance their degrees so that they can become nurse educators is really by increasing funding. So scholarships that really support nurses of color going back to advance their education, whether it's at the master's level or at the doctoral level, That's going to be important. The other thing when I'm looking at academia and also nursing leadership, whether it's in an organization, I don't think it's enough just to get people of color in. You have to get them in and support them and keep them. How are we going to do that? Are there mentorship programs at these organizations? Because again, the needs of nurses of color are unique. Nurses of color experience microaggressions, macroaggressions, all of the time in the workplace. And it makes me sad that that is still our lived experience. And even when I'm thinking about opportunities, like I said, my father is a Haitian immigrant, so he instilled in me that, you know, you cannot just be the best. You have to be extraordinary because that's how you're going to get the opportunities. So it's all, it's that mindset of you have to work twice as hard to get the same opportunity. So we are in these spaces where We have to work extra hard to prove our worth to other individuals who don't expect us to be the smart person at the table, the successful person at the table. So we're often sacrificing ourselves to work so hard so that we get those opportunities. And it shouldn't have to be that way. So if there were more people of color in leadership who can recognize that nurse who's doing wonderful things and has this career path, we can support that individual and so that they don't have to experience some of the challenges that maybe we had to experience coming up in our career. So we're in February, mm-hmm. and as we are embracing and celebrating Black History Month, um, at this moment, I'm thinking a lot about Black futures Yes, and those who are making history. We want to learn those stories. We want to embrace them. We want to elevate them. What are some of the stories that you want us to know that that you think are really helpful so that all of us get healthier? Oh, my goodness. There are so many. I think about Dr. Ernest Grant, who was here with us at the conference, and I was able to see him last week when I went to D.C. for the National Black Nurses Association Day on the Hill. And he was just recently the president of the American Nurses Association. Now we're talking about two anomalies. He's black and he's a male. For young black men who might be interested in healthcare to see him in that position. Yeah. It's and amazing. And he's someone we can still absorb his energy yeah. and talk to him about his journey. I think about Dr. Alicia Georges, who was the president of AARP. She was a previous president of the National Black Nurses Association. And she's just amazing. And the energy that she brings and all of the things that she's been through in her career. These are people. These are nurses you should know. Nurses that you can certainly connect with and learn so much from because they have really paved the way for people like me. We're talking about nurses who have experienced the civil rights movement. But you know something that's the great thing about nursing 
Nurses are scientists. Nurses are researchers. Nurses are entrepreneurs. Nurses can work in so many different spaces. We have nurses on Capitol Hill. Nurses are everywhere, and that's just so amazing. The opportunities are just limitless. Your career can really be whatever you want it to be. Design a career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. D- choose your own adventure. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have to sort of reframe how we look at nurses and what the identity of a nurse is because mm-hmm. they do so many different things. Special thanks to Sigma Nursing for warmly welcoming See You Now to their Creating Healthy Work Environments conference in Austin, Texas. And thanks to our episode guest, nurse practitioner and community and global health specialist, Dean Selena Gillis, for having the vision and courage to often be the first and only to break barriers and bring the next generation with her to all the corners of all our neighborhoods around the world. Coming up next, we take you to another live event, an entertaining evening of stories from frontline clinicians. And this one features Selena's colleague, friend, and fellow Brooklynite, nurse practitioner, Julius Johnson, better known as Dr. J. I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, which has the most New York City projects per square foot in the entire United States. I have friends that were killed as I was growing up. Uh, I have uncles and family members and friends that died prematurely from death over and over and over again. And I say that because it has created a frustrating issue of how do we get black men to care about their health? And to give you a running joke that's on Instagram in terms of how much men don't know about their own health care, there's this dad, he goes to his wife and he's like, honey, I'm on the phone with the doctor's office and they want to know what my dob is. And the wife is like, your dob? What are you talking about? And he's like, I don't know. They asked me for my dob. So I'm asking you, what's my dob? And the wife goes, you mean the day you was born? And he's like, oh, yeah, I was born on a Wednesday. I think it was nighttime, (laughs) right? So, but it's an accurate depiction of how much we don't take care of our own health. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.